That was fighting for gay rights mm -hmm. and people were killed. Nobody they were killed at Stonewall. Nobody was no, killed. Nobody. This is a picture of Sasha Belor in the early 1990s. Well, no, that's actually not true. This is Chad Michaels. But I bet you believe me for a second. Here's the real Sasha Velour, a queen that in many ways caused different trends to happen in the world of drag, even before she competed on the series. Come to think of it, Sasha really has come a long way from doing Manila Luzon-inspired makeup to now being the drag equivalent of Albert Einstein. So get your brain cells ready as we embark on the journey that was the unexpected reign of Sasha Velour. But before we start, this video is sponsored by Scentbird. Scentbird is the number one fragrance subscription company offering an innovative way to experience designer fragrances without breaking the bank. And you can indulge in a new scent every month, curated from a wide selection of top-notch brands. What makes joining Scentbird worth it is their impressive collection of over 700 perfumes and colognes, so you're bound to find a scent that you'll want to keep wearing to any special event. Some fragrances that I personally tried and always use are Aqua Our Home by Bivial Gari that smells like a blend of juicy sweet mandarin orange that is perfect for a casual stroll through the park. Then there's French The Fence by Mind Games, which is a more bold scent that will have you smelling like roses at the club. Finally, Extra Milk by Dead Cool is one that I've actually even gifted to some of my friends, because it's a nice soft aura that's added to your body. With each individual fragrance, you'll get a 30-day supply, so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full-size bottle. Now, if you're not convinced yet, make sure to head over to Semper.com by clicking the link in the description, and use code GREEN for a whopping 55% off your first order, available in the United States and Canada. Now, let's begin. As we all know, Sasha Velour was the first queen to ever be smart, something that became a big part of her brand, with her reign in itself being memed as the current brainy, due to her strong push during her time as a Rue girl to platform important historical queer moments. It's hard to argue against her success when she's built her career to a point that she is able to go on solo international tours that end up being sold out. And you don't really need to look that far into the algorithm to find some outstanding performances that she showcased. In a way, it speaks to her level of commitment to push her art to the most most extreme. We've seen her do this even with the rose petal reveal, where months after the audiences had gotten used to seeing it, she redid it at one of her shows but with a different twist to it, to show that yes, she still has a lot more tricks up her sleeve to show people. I mentioned in some of my past videos that within the world of drag, there's different types of queens. Like we got the influencers, we got the ones that focus on performing the house down boots, then there's the comedy queens, and countless more. But queens like Sasha Velour are what I call artist first and drag queen second. Any one of her shows seems to be built on the standard that whatever she delivers needs to be more impressive than what she delivered on her last performance. With that, it accentuates a growing hype to see what her mind will come up with next. The more time that passes from a season's airing, you start to look at certain queens differently just based on how they handle their post-drag race reign. This can be attributed to both queens in the winners and losers circle alike, which is where Sasha Velour's reign comes in. Something that hasn't changed throughout the years is the public outcry when fans don't agree with the winner of a season. I mean, as recently as UK vs. The World Season 2, Tia Coffey ended up winning the season after Marina Summer's shocking elimination within the first round of the lip sync for the crown. While it can be really disappointing when someone that many consider to be the clear winner of a season doesn't get the crown, it does open up the window for the winner to use their reign as a chance to change people's perception about them. Although, before we really start to go into Sasha's unexpected reign, I wanted to go through her journey to the crown, and why her sudden showcase of creativity at that finale was not a sprout of luck, and actually it was very indicative of her display of talent from years past. Now, obviously, when you think of Sasha Velour, many of you probably think of her as the bald queen from Brooklyn, New York, that walked into the room screaming. <laughs> But the truth about the brain of this individual is far more than what we see on the surface. Sasha's one of those queens that watched RuPaul during her first rise to fame in the 1990s. Specifically, she saw her cameo on a sitcom at the time called Sister Sister. And while she didn't fully understand what a drag queen was, all she knew was that Ru looked like an intriguing person to her. It's important to note that while it's funny to be in on the meme of Sasha being the first smart person, drag has always been about making a commentary about the real world. Yet it makes sense that people consider Sasha such a well educated queen, since her dad worked as a Russian history professor at a university, and her mom was the editor for Yale University Press. So you can probably imagine the philosophical conversations that they constantly were having with a young Sasha while she was growing up. On Drag Race, something that fans go on to learn is that Sasha actually has a Russian background, even spending her early university career studying there. Afterwards, she'd end up moving to New York to study cartoon animation. Yet it's during that time period in her early 20s that she'd have to deal with a life 
life-changing event, which was the cancer diagnosis of her mother. At this point, her mother was living in Illinois, so Sasha had to constantly take flights to and from New York to be able to see her constantly. But it was worth every penny, because it gave her the time to properly bond a lot more with her mother in ways that they hadn't for most of her life. Even with talking about the newly found art of drag that Sasha had found, her mother gave her nothing but unconditional love. What's more is that being so close to her mother's battle with cancer offered Sasha more of a perspective on people having to deal with the disease, especially women who begin to lose their hair due to chemotherapy. Unfortunately, Sasha's mom would end up losing her battle with cancer. An advice that she told Sasha before passing away was, quote, you don't have to worry about all the things you want to do. Just focus on how you want to spend the next 15 minutes. In what was a direct tribute to her mother, Sasha would make the aesthetic of her drag character one of a bald queen to represent her mom's journey, where she lost her hair, tried on wigs, until ultimately wanting to find confidence and happiness with not caring about what anyone else thought about when they saw her, subsequently inspiring Sasha to look at beauty and glamour in a different way. To add layers to this, Sasha would end up incorporating a lot of her mom's wardrobe into her drag in the years that followed. For example, the outfit that she wore for the infamous lesbian broccoli scene. But speaking of season 9, when the season 9 promos were released in early 2017, there was talk about the New York City queens, but there wasn't necessarily a big hype about Sasha Velour. Yet slowly people started to learn more about her, like how she began to get popular in New York City for her incorporation of projectors that made for a more elevated performance experience. But other than that, the first time she showcases the glimpse of what her narrative is going to be this season is with the release of the music video Clap, featuring her, Peppermint, Alexis Michelle, and Aja. Originally, Sasha wasn't interested in doing any type of music within her Rue Girl career, because she viewed drag queen music as both oversaturated and low quality. But she ended up changing her mind on the subject when the other queens talked her into doing a sort of weird academic talk rapping that ended up resonating with a good portion of people given how catchy it was. Her verse in Clad is something that has a special place in my heart, because at the time it was constantly on replay in my own head. I mean, gender is a construct tear it apart, that was fighting for gay rights. Radical, magical, liberal art. Gender is a construct tear it apart. Wearable art and terrible art. It's the motherfucking world is unbearable art. Something that was a theme to Sasha's aesthetic at the time of filming season 9 was to try to focus on that androgynous take, or I guess bold makeup choices too, such as her infamous unibrow in her season 9 entrance look, something that she'd go on to tone down by the time she came back to film the finale almost a year later. Her entrance look and finale look feel like parallel versions of each other. Aside from the difference in colors, they both have similar silhouette, a crown, gloves, and I'm not sure if I'm reaching, but in her entrance look, you can see that she's wearing a pin of a rose, foreshadowing of her performance performance in the finale. What's interesting about season 9 in general is that they had a cast filled with people that were really good competitors. Sasha's time in the first half of the season, while not the most groundbreaking, still managed to uphold herself to a niche of drag that we weren't necessarily getting with everyone else. I mean, don't get me wrong, there was other competitors doing original stuff like Nina Bonina Brown's peach look. It's just that Sasha was doing something that was more specific to her, like her Lady Gaga look where she chose to go with the applause video, or the choice to represent New York City by choosing modern queer art pioneers like Andy Warhol. At first, she didn't like zoning in on the brand of being an artsy queen, but understood that it was beneficial for her to hone in on it, especially while filming the show. On season 9 episode 4, Sasha gets paired with Shea Kool-Aid to work together as partners for the morning news challenge where queens had to improvise most of their acting. What ended up getting attention though was the friendship between these two, that for some reason had a lot of fans shipping them together. And rightfully so. I mean, look at the material. Moving on, another highlight from the first half of season 9 was the infamous mirror interaction between her, Eureka, and Valentina. The don't joke about that moment is more than just a meme at this point. It's like a way of telling someone to not cross a certain line. But in the context of the quote, while getting ready for the runway, Valentina asked the girls if she could share with them one of her biggest insecurities, to which Eureka responded, eating. Can I tell you guys about one of the disorders that I have that I'm struggling with? Eating. Don't joke about that. I remember that at the time the episode aired, naturally there was a number of people that took to social media to call out Eureka for trying to make fun of an eating disorder, especially for Valentina who was actively dealing with it. But while I completely understand that the joke could be offensive to some people, isn't it safe to say that it was kind of weird for people to crucify Eureka for an eating disorder joke when she also has been dealing with eating disorders for most of her life? Yet to be fair, Sasha went on to say in interviews that apparently Eureka had a problem of trying to stick unfunny offensive one-liners into 
pretty much any situation, which tended to get on everyone's nerves. So to her, this was yet another one of those instances. Either way, this came at a time when queens started to really police themselves into how they were acting, with even Kim Chi saying at a viewing party that the constant censorship of the queens is gonna make the show boring. As the queen of Don't Joke About That, it made me even more curious to see what she would whip up for season 9 episode 8, which was the roast of Michelle Visage. What this episode proved was that Sasha had the flexibility within her skill set to take what many would consider a personality that I guessed wasn't the most comedic, especially for the setting of a roast, but she managed to take that aspect of her being this snobby smart gay and wove it into a performance where she sold us. Eventually, by season 9 episode 9, Sasha gets paired with Shea Coulee, and after creating a skit together, they once again win the challenge, earning Sasha her second and final shared win of the season. So, after 10 queens sashayed away throughout the competition, it was time for the season 9 top 4 to deliver their verses. This was the second ever top 4 verse challenge, with All Stars 2 having been the first just prior to season 9's airing. Her verse in the top 4 episode talks about how when it comes to her drag career, she relies on intellect rather than conventional beauty standards. In fact, she glorifies the individuals whose drag is different or quote monstrous, and implores more people to join the revolution by being innovative. She goes on to say to put your own worth on yourself with a crown, experiment with your gender, and don't confine yourself to societal norms, but most importantly, don't give up. The ending of her verse sort of hyperbolizes her existence by saying that she's more than reality and is actually a magical being. And yeah, maybe I was stretching it with the way I just analyzed these lyrics, but if you have your own interpretation of her verse, comment below. So now we get to the season 9 lip sync for the crown. This is the very first time that they ever implemented this twist. So many of us were shocked, but also curious to see how it was going to play out. After having a mostly safe run throughout the episodes, once Sasha learned about the finale twist, she instantly wanted to outperform all the other girls, because she saw it as a chance to prove herself to the viewers as someone that was memorable. There's many theories as to why the lip sync for the crown was introduced to the finale's format. Some feel it was because the fan base was tired of the predictability of the seasons, since by this point they knew the formula. The queen with the most wins, or least amount of times in the bottom, would win the crown. It happened in season 8 with Bob the Drag Queen, and most recently, Alaska during All Stars 2. Shea Coulee went into the finale with 4 challenge wins. At the time, she was the second queen from the main series of Drag Race to ever accomplish this, with Sharon Needles in season 4 being the last. While Sasha was known within the New York City drag scene as a queen that could give some really creative lip syncs, the general audience really didn't have any expectation of her. In fact, it seemed more like the other 3 queens would have been able to beat her in a lip sync which she'd of course prove everyone wrong. The idea of the rose petal reveal was actually something that she had come up with just the day before. The song So Emotional by Whitney Houston was about an overwhelming amount of emotion, so why not show that emotions through an explosion of roses? To make this happen, she went to buy a bunch of flowers that she'd used at the beginning of her performance to tear apart, and fake rose petals from Michaels that she'd hide in both her gloves and under her wig being warmed up by her bald head. In the months leading up to the season 9 finale, all the girls in the top 4 thought that the competition aspect of the show was over. So to discover last minute that they were going to have to take part in one of the most intense high stakes portions of the competition yet was really intimidating and scary. But at the same time, Sasha Velour was the only queen in the top four that had never landed in the bottom two. So many viewers, including myself, were super curious to see what she'd bring. Nowadays, lip syncs in the finales are normalized, so everyone sort of expects it. But imagine the level of stress of having to lip sync for your life in front of a giant live audience of people. People, while the fate of your drag career hangs in front of you. Anyways, if you're a Drag Race fan that follows the Drag Race algorithm on platforms like Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, then you know that Sasha Velour's rose petal reveal is referenced every couple months. But it really is such a moment. I'm not sure that people realize just how shocking of a thing it was, because it really is a lot more intense when you look at its historical context. In a way, you would have to have a very limited understanding of the main seasons for it to have an even bigger effect on you. Like, I imagine that if I'm a new fan that watched most of the double digit seasons first, then by the time I watch season 9, even if I'm not aware of the reveal, I'd be used to the extravagant twist by then. But if you are one of those fans to watch the modern seasons first before season 9, share your experience below. What made the rose petal reveal so significant was just how difficult it was for any other queen to even come close to besting it. The difference between Sasha's approach to reveals than what we'd see in the seasons that followed was that Sasha centered her performance around the song, while future queens centered the song around the reveal, making most of them 
come across as out of left field and not organically introduced into the performance. Like, it's weird to think that there's a parallel universe out there where instead of getting so emotional by Whitney Houston, Sasha gets stronger by Britney Spears. Something that she'd go on to elaborate in interviews that she wouldn't have used her rose petal reveal if that had been the case. Instead, she describes how just like Peppermint's performance of Stronger was about transforming yourself into a more powerful version of yourself is what brought an extra layer to the meaning of the song. And in that same way, if Sasha had been performing alongside her, she would have used the scissors that were strapped to her thigh under the dress she was wearing and utilized it as a prop to chop her wig into little bits until finally allowing her to fully transform into a bald queen, which honestly probably would have gagged us too. And I hope that one day she performs what that version would have been like. After Sasha wins her lip sync against Shea Coulee, she then faces off in the final round against Peppermint. The white mask that she's wearing throughout the first part of the song is an intentional reference to Valentina's mask gate fiasco, since according to her, she wanted to pay reference to an iconic moment in the season to therefore make her performance memorable too. While it's true that Sasha Valour's track record going into the finale wasn't the most impressive, if we really look over her time throughout the season, there was a lot more moments where she slayed than just her two shared wins with Shay. The first that comes to mind is the makeover challenge, which by the way, I think this was the first makeover in their franchise where you could tell that the queens were bringing extra outfits for the makeover so that they could make sure that both the looks presented on the runway were cohesive, as opposed to looks where you can tell it's just two random outfits that the queen got for the runway. Not just that, but Sasha was really good at getting into character for her performances, like Kim Kardashian the Rusical where she played Lindsay Lohan, or her Snatch Game where she played Marlena Dietrich. So while it's true that Shay definitely had a winning run, it wasn't like Sasha had done terrible in the season either. That being said, the season 9 finale had over 859,000 viewers tune in on their TVs to see the lip sync for the crown, which was an increase of over 218% from the season 8 finale, proving that the switch in networks from Logo TV to VH1 was a huge positive for the franchise. And that's not even counting all the millions of people that watched it online, which typically doesn't get counted in the official ratings. What's a sort of funny, obscure story that not many people talk about anymore was the whole Rosegate fiasco that happened with Valentina. Essentially, shortly after the filming of the season 9 finale, there was a two-week period before it actually aired. It's during this time that Valentina took to social media and told her fans that instead of sending hate, to send rose emoticons to Queens, which then ignited a mass spam of fans going to a bunch of Rue Girls Instagrams and flooding their comment sections with roses. Especially Shea Coulee, who some were already hearing rumors about what was about to happen in a couple weeks. But anyways, back to the main topic at hand, the aftermath of Sasha's crowning was somewhat mixed. There was a good portion of people that expressed support for Shea Coulee as the true deserving winner of the season. But others argued that at the end of the day, there was no argument about who had won the lip sync. This wasn't some lip sync where Sasha just happened to win. It was that nobody could argue that she didn't win it, since it was really obvious. To add some more context for the era, 2017 was the first year to have Donald Trump as president of the United States, jumpstarting what would become a shift in pop culture, with conservative ideologies beginning to threaten the protections of LGBT people and other minorities. Basically, people were sort of scared of what was to come, and Sasha kind of filled this void where she brought attention to the fact that while yes, it was a funny meme to sort of view Sasha as this super educated queen that knows her history, that it's important to attribute some of those qualities at an individual level, pushing forward in the years to come by constantly sharing with fans the importance of being politically active. Over the next seven years, Sasha would build her brand to a standard that elevated her to an extremely well-respected level among the fan base. Her first ever one-woman show was launched in 2019, titled Smoke and Mirrors, something that she had been working on for many years leading up to it. It got some really good reviews from critics as well, who described it as a perfect embodiment of modern art through the scope of drag. Which rightfully so. I mean, a lot of what Sasha does is just so visually stimulating from an audience perspective. Her choice to constantly go for a color blocking style is such a great way of creating content that is eye candy. It's probably why her branding has had so much success over the course of her career. Now, something that has become a subtopic for anyone that won a crown is if they will return to an all-winner season. I'm not sure if production ever asked Sasha to compete on All-Star 7, but we know that she apparently was asked by production to be a lip sync assassin for All Stars 5, but that she rejected it out of fear that they would pin her against Shea Coulee and didn't want to take away focus from her. Which, whether it's true or not, I can see them at least trying to do this because imagine the gag that it would have been. Fortunately though, after season 15 finished, Sasha did say that she would love to return again only as long as she can compete alongside Sasha Colby. Moving on, we are now in the year 2024, where Sasha Velour is still managing to break into new ground. Just a couple months ago, she was a guest judge on the first season of Drag Race Germany, which yes, 
I had no idea that she could speak the language either, but here we are. She also had Anna Locking, the main judge of Drag Race Spain, design one of her recent looks for her brand new tour that she's currently on right now. What's more is that she ended up being the perfect candidate for the new cast of HBO's We're Here Season 4. While the season has not aired yet, they did just release the promo for it, and it's looking like it might end up being a success just based off the trailer alone. And also the still of her as a drag king. What I think Sasha Velour's career has proven, especially with all her artistic shows, was that drag really has no limitation. I don't know if we would have ever seen a queen in the 1980s do a show like that of Sasha Velour's, mostly because I doubt people weren't as acquainted with getting mobile projectors and using them, but also drag just like any other art form has changed since then. Sasha Velour is one of those queens from RuPaul's Drag Race that really had a huge effect on the show during their run. The reason why it was so significant is because it happened around the era of Drag Race where the stakes were super high, and the lack of seasons made it feel like it was much more life and death than it really was. But one thing for sure, without Sasha Velour's unexpected reign, the world of drag would be a lot different than it is today. Thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Make sure to click the link in the description and use code GREEN for a whole 55% off your order. Shipping available in the United States and Canada. I'd like to take a moment to thank my patrons. In the Elite Pink Squad, we have Matthew Burns, Gay Uncle, Poppers Alberta, Suri Tish, Natasha De Leon, and Las Pocitas. And in the Green Squad, we have Azure, Cayman Rider Furry, Edgar Allan Pup, IJS, Not a Punch, But a Keek, Jack Beck, Aaron W, Milk Forever, Captain Chaos, Bashir with the Good Beard, and Galeria Gomez. If you'd like to see your name on the screen, you can support me on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, as we are almost at 100k. Give this video a like and comment below what you thought about it, and I'll see you guys next time.